So it's my great pleasure now to introduce our speaker, Sean Campbell. He was born in Leeds in 1961. Uh, he went to art college, but also trained um, as both um, a dancer and a musician in the following years. He composed soundtracks for a number of dance and theatre companies. Since 2007, Sean has championed the legacy of a true national and international sporting pioneer and trailblazer by founding the Arthur Wharton Foundation, which aims to work towards the promotion of embracing culture and diversity and to fight against racism in sport and beyond using Arthur Wharton's story to inspire, motivate and educate. It's an absolute honour to be here and a privilege. Uh, here we are in the Mining Institute, Common Room. And I, th I suppose, really, I'll start at the end of Arthur's life because this is so poignant. Um, Arthur died as a miner. He worked on the coal face. And we're going to start really by showing you this short video. It's about three minutes long, and it will give you a basic overview of Arthur's life. Arthur died of a uh, terrible death. He died penniless in a place called Edlington, Yorkshire Main Colliery is where he's buried. And uh, without further ado, let's now go back to, I suppose, in a sense, the beginning of Arthur's story. And uh, we'll start by showing you this very short video, which will hopefully educate and entertain at the same time. Sometimes I'm aware that you see the moments of wonder, the stories that should be told for generations. Who greatness? But our stories are buried as the lost in time. An incredible life with incredible achievements. Yes, a name forgotten. The first ever professional black football player. The first ever fastest man in the world. A cricketer, a rugby player, a cycling champion, a trailblazer. One man who never saw it. This is the story of Arthur Walton. Born in Ghana 155 years ago, Arthur moved to Darlington, age 19, to train as an instrument. A young black teenager out of place in the world of England was about to go to the land of black athletes across the world. Arthur was spotted in gold for Darlington FC, the coolest customer that has ever stood between the goalposts, and moved on to play for a number of pro clubs. In the FA Cup semi final team of Preston North End and in the top flight for Sheffield United. In 1894, our half on the official, no man of his heritage had ever turned play. When not between the post, Arthur would play the wing in old, heavy, thick skin boots. His speed was unmatched, so much so that he ran 100 yards in 10 seconds flat becoming the world's first official basket man in the planet, breaking records and breaking barriers. These world records stood for over 30 years. And with a professional critical and professional working, this man of pure excellence did stop him, pushing boundaries in sports and the race, and winning some championship in his spare time. Sometimes our world produces moments of wonder, stories that could be told for generations. Still greatness. So remember the name. Arthur Wilson. Arthur Wilson. Arthur Wilson is number one. Arthur Wilson is number one. So, uh, there you have it. I mean, what a remarkable sporting icon. Can you believe that somebody came to this country from Jamestown, Accra, Ghana, was embraced by the northeast of England and went on to become arguably, or in our case, unarguably, 
the world's greatest ever all-round sports person. There has never been anybody like Arthur, and there never will be. Again, it's poignant that we're here in Newcastle, not just at the Mining Institute, but here in the heart of the northeast of England, really, because Arthur played for Newcastle and District before, I think, the very season that they became Newcastle United. So we have very good links with Newcastle, and it gives me great pleasure to, to be here. It really does, and to meet you wonderful people, all who are obviously involved in the world of antiquities. You see, Anything to do with antiquities is to do with history. You know, it's how we learn. Our motto is connecting the present, that's me here with you now, to the past, Arthur Wharton, and it's for the future. It really does help us to kind of understand how far we've come or not. So when we look back to Arthur's day, a question might be, can you imagine, or what was the racism that Arthur would have suffered back then? But of course, in 1883, when Arthur Wharton first arrived in Darlington, he arrived to study as a Methodist preacher. He studied at Cleveland College in Darlington. Um, and he was there where the trainer that you read about called Manny Hebron, we've just discovered he's not actually called Manny Hebron, the trainer. He's actually called Manny Harbron. We know this because a short few months ago, I got a phone call from Thornaby saying, Sean, I've been following you for years. We love the work you're doing. But one problem I have is that in all of the texts, Arthur, Arthur Wharton's trainer is referenced as Manny Hebron. And I'm like, well, of course, that must be right. Well, it's, it's not right. I'm his great-great-grandson, and he was called Manny Harbron. And my goodness me, I have to tell you, that was, that was music to my ears. Simply because if we're going to document history, it better be done right. You know, if you're going to find out information about people and celebrate them, you want the right information. And that was the wrong information. Short couple of weeks later, this Manny Hebron's Ronald Harbron came through to see me. And I have to say, since that meeting, it's been a revelation to us at the foundation. We found out where Manny Harbron was buried. He was buried in Darlington in West Cemetery. And with the family's permission, we took out the entire headstone and everything. We left, of course, we left Manny there, but we did take out everything else and had it all cleaned and polished. And it is absolutely stunning. That was the way that we could best, you know, anybody who wants to research Manny Harbron and the role that he played in 1883 as the legendary trainer of Darlington Cricket and Football Club. There are people who want to go and see that grave, and we felt it was only right that they saw it, that people see it in the light that it deserves. That was a great man who formed that club, and he did great things. Oh, Something what's happened there? That's just decided to come on by itself. Uh, would the technical expert please try and start that? I'll talk on. Um, yeah, Dar uh, Arthur came to Darlington in 1883. And like I, like I was saying before, one of the things you might be wondering is what on earth did Arthur do at that time? Well, there weren't very many black and brown people in this country in 1883. So Arthur was largely seen as a novelty. Ah, we're all watching the video again, aren't we? Which I'd like to watch. I, I don't really know that. It's still going on. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's that's what I mean, though, and it's wonderful. Um, yeah, so just to go back, um, yeah, of course, arriving in the northeast of England, I mean, the northeast of England is a hard place. You know, it has a very rich history in the character of the people of the northeast of England. I'm from, Dal from Leeds originally. I was training as a ballet dancer and contemporary dancer in London and uh, went to Leeds for a week and I'm still here. That's what the northeast does to you. It brings you in and it doesn't let you go. And if it puts its arms around you, you're onto something because you have to earn your stripes here in the northeast of England. You can't walk into anything. Everybody's hard work. Everybody is trying and everybody's challenging. And it's such a wonderful place to be. It was the northeast of England that threw its arms around our Arthur. 
and said, hey, look, man, you have got some turn of speed. And this was Manny Harbrum, who saw Arthur probably running across the forecourt of Darling College in uh, Cleveland College in Darlington. Do you fancy playing a game of football? Do you fancy running? And Arthur, well, of course, I'll give it a go. The rest is history. There's only two men in history who've ever been the fastest man on the planet and a professional footballer. That is Usain Bolt and Arthur Walton. That's it in the history of the entire world. Usain Bolt, admittedly, it was a very short space of time. He was a professional footballer. But um, there is a documentary team that have been, you know, following me around for a number of years. One of the producers actually here today, uh, surprisingly to me. So, Andrew, thank you for coming. It's wonderful to see you. Um, and in that documentary, you will see that Usain Bolt, uh, we had a wonderful conversation. And Usain Bolt says basically that without Arthur Wharton, there is no Usain Bolt. And that is the truth. It really is. The beginning of the black presence in sport, in all of those sports you saw up there just now, rugby, cricket, cycling, athletics, football, so on. Arthur was at the very beginning of that story. And it was the northeast of England that threw their arms around Arthur and enabled him to achieve what he does. It's about providing opportunity. If you provide people with an opportunity, they will either make the most of it or they won't. Arthur <coughs> did, but it did come at a cost. We know what fame is like today, particularly with social media and those kind of things. That wasn't available back in Arthur's day. We haven't heard Arthur speak. We haven't seen him on the TV screens. It's hardly surprising, therefore, that few people have actually heard of Arthur. Of course, now, lots of people have heard of Arthur, simply by the fact that people like my good self, like Football Unites Races and Divides, like Show Races and the Red Card, Kick It Out and all the others. We've all kind of tried to champion Arthur, and his name is now being globally recognised. Arthur was a peculiar individual, let's say. If you can imagine, the 3rd of July, 1886, and the backstory that goes with it. 3rd of July, 1886, Arthur Wharton was on the start line for the AAA Athletics at the first ever official timing of a 100 yards record. That took place at Stamford Bridge. So whenever you're watching Chelsea play football last time, in fact, Chelsea are here tomorrow, aren't they? Playing Newcastle, yeah. So Arthur played for Newcastle and he ran his 100 yard record at Chelsea. Perhaps we should have had hindsight and uh, got something going on tomorrow at the, Chelsea, uh, the, the Newcastle game. But just imagine, at exactly the same time Arthur's on that st start line, Mercedes-Benz, Carl Benz, rolls out the world's first ever motor car on exactly the same day. So there you have man and machine, and we look at Formula One now, Mercedes-AMG. And who's their lead driver? It's Lewis Hamilton who ironically, his father was born the same place as Arthur's father on the island of Grenada in the Caribbean. Arthur's father was a Scottish missionary. He was white. He went to Ghana to further his, his Methodist preachings and he married a Fante princess, a Ghanaian princess. Hence, Arthur's heritage is Ghanaian, but also Grenadian. So 30 July, 1886, Arthur's on the line, Bangor's gone. And at the same time, in Stuttgart, Germany, maximum speed 10 mile an hour is the first motor car chugging out. <laughs> but another great historical fact for the 3rd of July, it's interesting, isn't it, that it's the 3rd of July and there are three historical events. 3rd of July, 1886, the New York Tribune rolled out the world's first ever linotype print. So you now have man, machine, and the written word all on the same day in history. This is not widely known. It's, it's where my research leads me. It, I'd like to join dots and I like to, you know, I don't tick boxes unless they're properly ticked. Hence my enthusiasm for the discovery of Mani Habron, not Hebron. It's got to be right. This picture that you see behind you, um, this is where the story of my involvement with Arthur began really. I was invited, as um, was said earlier, I've, I've written music for Scottish Ballet, Zimbabwe National Ballet, Durham Theatre Company, Cleveland, various things. It was just 
I just had this mad passion for ballet and contemporary dance, but I fell out of love with the art form of it. It became a bit arty farty, flicky flicky for me. Uh, it kind of lost its narrative and it became quite elitist. I'm not saying that that is a reason not to watch dance. I'm saying for that reason, you perhaps should watch it. But by the same token, I always had a passion for writing music for it. So I came to New Newcastle, ironically, Northumberland University, studied a creative arts degree, majored in music. And whilst I was there, actually wrote music for Scottish Ballet and various other people. It just worked out a treat. But I was then asked in 2007 to come to Middlesbrough Town Hall and give a talk about the history of black people and music. So it was really about the relationship of bringing music from Africa to the West and how they both, you know, enabled each other to grow, how the music came together, not collided, uh, which they did sometimes, but how they melted together. So I turned up in Middlesbrough Town Hall, discovered there were some really eminent speakers and it was jam packed. And I thought, my God, what am I doing here? Um, and it was there where a friend of mine said, hey, Sean, have you seen this? And it was just a, a very innocent pamphlet. It was the Taste of Africa Awards. It was a lady called Shadi Sangawara who holds these wonderful youth awards and the Taste of Africa, who had invited me along. And there on this brochure, just very simple, Arthur Wilton, first black footballer, with a couple of other little lines underneath it. And I was thinking, how can I be so involved in my life, generally growing up, in sport and activity, and not know about this guy? So I went back to my humble shop in Darlington. I used to have a, a furniture shop, and it was quite funky. If you can imagine like a tree trunk carved into a sun lounger, that's what you get if you came into my shop. It was that kind of thing. And um, I thought, I've got to do something to pay tribute to this young man. So I found this really funky piece of wood. Um, and, and I was just following the grains of the wood. There was no embellishment in that whatsoever. But Arthur wasn't in it. So if you can just imagine the right hand side and the left hand side, that's actually just in the grain of the wood. I'd already painted it. But when I looked at it again, I thought, oh my God, I haven't actually made this as a tribute to Arthur. But the knots of the wood on the left, it's like a lady bowing her head. And just above it, the Scottish fall time is actually in the wood. And then you have all these ethical colours, and I thought, my gosh, this has got to be the piece for Arthur. So then I started hitting Arthur and the Quakers in the middle of it. Some guy came in the shop and he said, oh, what's this you doing? And I'm, I was all, I can't believe like this guy, Arthur Wharton, you know. Uh, we've got to do right by him, so I'm just painting a picture. Any of you who are familiar with the media will know that the media can jump on things. Well, the next day, the Northern Echo came in, said some chap had been down to the offices and uh, mentioned that you paid a paid, 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 excuse me, painting a tribute to this icon. Um, can we have a look at it? Would you mind if we uh, you know, take a picture of it? I said, no, no, not at all. Next day, the newspaper, local businessman starts campaign to a drive for one. I didn't have any time for a campaign. I can tell you that right now. But looking back, it was the best thing I could have done because I realized very, very quickly that all of the work around Arthur hadn't been done. He hadn't been celebrated. There was no meaningful testament to him, other than a wonderful one by a football United racing device in Sheffield, who erected a headstone for Arthur. Arthur died in 1930. He laid in an unmarked grave until 1998. And that's why we erected a headstone for him, right? The problem with that headstone was it had the wrong date and it definitely it had the 12th, it had the 13th of December. <laughs> I'm looking for some, the number 13 for Arthur. Well, it took me a, a number of years to try and persuade those good people who put that in place to change that date. And uh, I took it upon myself just before two years ago to think this can't go on. I'd said to you all earlier about how important the importance of properly. You know, looking at antiquities and looking at history and making sure the evidence stacked up and that the dates are right. So I spoke to the family, to Arthur's family, and I said, Look, we just, we just need to do this. We have to get that data right because it's now a matter of historical fact. At the moment, it's historical fiction because it's got the wrong dates. 
schools all over the country celebrate Hanukkah for Black History Month in, 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 in October. I'm sure you're all aware Black History Month is the month of October. We are currently in um, Asian, South Asian History Month, by the way, uh, celebrating. And you know, how many months? There's a month for everything in the month. Black History Month has always been important to me, not because it's a month, because Black History Month to me is every day of every minute of every year. My father was from Barbados in the Caribbean. He came over as part of the English generation. You probably will look there now and understand why my hair looks like a person. You know, it's my Caribbean roots. Um, those things are very, very meaningful when we look at the English generation. But we think half of us long before that. The English generation was 1956, or no, 1948, actually, wasn't it? Uh, my father came over from Barbados in 1956, I've got uh, we're still here. Barbados was the oldest slave colony. It still is the oldest slave colony. It was the first ever British slave colony. And that was 400 years ago. Um, it was the most brutal, inhumane episode in, in modernity of slavery. And yet, 400 years later, I'm still in front of you, still speaking to you. So that's how we found the English to survive. And thank God we did, because I can bring you the story of our fact. Um, I'm going to just go on to the next slide here. Um, if this works, then it still looks okay. <laughs> Essentially, Arthur Morton was just a remarkable, remarkable individual, and he needs to be embraced with him on our points. Certainly, in Newcastle. Certainly in Darlington, he played an epic of Sark 10 pound against Sunderland. Um, I'm sure I'm going to spend a lot more data wins than me, but uh, you know, when you think of this time on the cover of the in 1883, and you, you can measure, you use that as a yardstick to measure how far we've come. So, how do I think really is moving? You can look at the and that kind of right, so I'll use that different methods, modern technology. Brilliant, but it's just felt to be different. Yes. So I we created a guy called John Keeble, uh, very close to me. When we started that campaign, he said, Look, we need something to celebrate Arthur's heritage, Scottish Garnet, obviously. So there you see the Scottish Soul Tire and the Garnet flag. And of course, we're in Darlington, it's where the Arthur Morton Foundation is based. And so that was the image we created. We put it up in front of the T-shirt, and it's worn by many, many celebrated people uh, across the world. Now, I'm um, fixing this. Oh, there we go. I'm going the wrong way. Is that right? The other way. You should just stay with me. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> what the fuck is the left now? Right. Um. Yeah, so when we when we celebrate people, it needs to be that way. And it's nice to look at and look at this campaign. It's like, how do we get this guy recognized? You know, I'm nobody. Who's going to listen to me? So we started creating things. We started creating things that meant something. There's a chap called Tom Rain, a your filming the recent Bloody Fire, and where that's gone, where he, yeah. Tom is a victim of that. He passed away a short few years ago, but before he did, he created this. Extraordinary platform. He also was a sculptor at Lilliput, if anybody collected the Lilliput things, he also did a lot of that stuff. And uh, what we see here is a commemorative plaque, and it shows the life of running, it has the Methodist cross, the Scottish saltire, the windmill of Rotherham, it has the five pillars of social orientation by which the Ghanaian people live their lives, it has the English rose, the black style of Ghana, the nutmeg and the island of Grenada in the Caribbean. The sheets that are pressed in the North End, Arthur's father's church, which is still in Ghana today. All of this is depicted in this plaque. These plaques now are down the walls of FIFA, UEFA, the Professional Football Association, Wembley Stadium, the Professional Footballers Association. Usain Bolt was gifted one for crew and board with us, which was wonderful. That hangs proudly in his home in Jamaica. Um, so, yeah, we felt that the best way we could do this was to just bring people on board and start creating things. This is a picture of Arthur. Um, I was in the shop, uh, the same funky shop I was talking about earlier. 
And I got a phone call from uh, the North Mecca, a guy called Jim Interesting, who now works for the Great North Ireland Service. And he said, Charlie, Charlie, somebody's just been up the echo and said they found a picture of Arthur. And, you know, I was thinking, it's probably really not going to be. This was at quarter to midnight, by the way. So <laughs> there must have been something serious about it. The next day, I went down to the shop and he walked him into a scene. And when he held up, when he held up the picture, when he walked in, he showed me the back. And he went, there you go, Sean. And I'm looking at the back of it, and it, it was covered in stuff and dirt and dry. It was then I thought, oh my God, there's some edge to what everything turned turn around. Perhaps it is a real deal, you know. And he turned it around, and there was that. It was unbelievable. That picture had never been seen before. And that is balanced, believe it or not, winning the Cleveland Challenge Cup in 1887. How they did that, but the fastest man in the world in goal, I will never know. <laughs> but perhaps that's why we do football in you. Uh, but there you go. Um, you know, it's quite incredible, isn't it, when you think about that picture. And incidentally, the cup that you see in that picture, when I mention about writing history and bringing it into the present day, I had the unending task of finding that cup, but I did find one. And, and the reason I'm wearing this tie today is because this is the tie of first Falklands football team in North and First. Why am I wearing it? I'm wearing it because on my quest to find that cup, I contacted the North Riding FA, the Durham FA, you name it, everybody in the area, where is this cup? As it turned out, I kept getting sent photographs of cups that looked nothing like this. <laughs> so I was thinking, why are they sending me these images? It clearly is not the cup I'm looking for. And then I got this one message from North Riding FA saying, well, there's one cup it's just been paid for. And it's at the uh, Royal, Royal British Legion in Thirst. It might be the one, we don't know. So I rang up the Royal British Legion, I ran spoke to uh, Ken Garber, Jeff Garber, the chairman, and he said, yeah, come through, have a look. So I went through, my God, I walked into that room, so I let him move around, but I can't just sort of camera, so I gave that. I walked into that room, and in the cabinet, right in front of me, glass cabinet, I knew this copy of me, just on this photograph. I knew that was the cup. But it didn't have its lid on. It was just, just the base of the cup. So I said to them and said, well, look, can, can we just take it out of the cabinet? I took it out of the cabinet. And I looked at it, and on the back of it, it was just, I wrote the whole thing into the mark, but it was shaped like an old one or something. What we had come to understand is when I found that cup, it was still being there for. We now know it's the second oldest cup in the history of the world that's being continuously prayed for. And it's still being continuously prayed for. The value of that for scrap metal was about five grand. Once I found it and made them aware of what it was, and we brought it to the attention of the National Football Museum. Oh, incidentally, that night, when I was there and saw the cup, I was like, my God, Jeff, this is it. And he couldn't believe it, the chairman. But he couldn't believe it had this remarkable thing in his possession. And he said, look, the lads are playing football. They're going to be back in about half an hour. Is there any chance? Or can somebody give me a 10 minute warning as well, please? Because I can, I can definitely order on and I don't want to give you that piece of it. Um, yeah, and all, all the lads came in from football, they had their time piece and they put the match on. The Jeff said, turn the match on. Big man wants to tell you a story. And I was telling them about the cup. And this is just a bunch of white guys, right? No people have put in there, but I'll tell you now, the warmth and the feeling of emotion from those young lads and knowing what they had in their presence was remarkable. And I said to them, look guys, I'm going to make the other one now. You've made money. And what we did was, as a thank you to them, when England had their 50th anniversary of winning the 66th World Cup, and they were all at um, the National Football Museum, I got the license to basically go through with the whole of the first Falcons team and their staff, and they met Bobby Charlton and everybody there. It was just absolutely wonderful. And of course, I wore their tie in tribute to them. That cup is still being played for now. So every year, it's probably got about 500 grand now somewhere. So we put money in their coffers. I'm sure they're very grateful. 
Um, but basically, this is how you protect history. This is what our speeches are about. They're about finding things. And it's not the monetary value, it's the value of the story that it's going to tell you. So that kind tells us when you look at the back of it, all about iron this in the all of the steel industry it is etched beautifully on that. I, I will make a promise to you today that when you're doing anything related uh, around the steel subject, I will probably get that to you for whoever will speak with on today, and you can come and see it in person because it is absolutely remarkable. But it didn't have a lid, right? So I thought, oh, it's a lid. <laughs> I went to BBCTs. And I put that this, this appeal to the public. Some of you, you're probably all not aware, but in 2012, Darwin's a football team went into administration. I'm the guy who was banging on the door with a briefcase and said the day. And it was the first time in history anyone has ever gone into administration and come out and said, same day. I'm really proud of that. But I didn't do it because of Sean Campbell. I did it because that is exactly what I would have done if he'd been around today. He, he would have made sure. That his responsibilities and his legacy would have been sure he would have done anything to save that club. So when I'm in the door in India on holiday, I'm getting a phone call about the club. Yes, as soon as I came back, I jumped into the club. And um, why am I talking about that in football club and saying that I've just kind of some track, track very slightly that I should come back to? Oh, yes. Um, what is remarkable about things like that is that it is about putting people in touch with their history. When I saw the emotion of the people of Darlington when they were just about to lose their club, it was absolutely heartbreaking. I'm not that kind of football fan. I'm the football fan who has to sit at the wall and shout at myself. You know, I want to get into the game and don't want those distractions. I love football and I love sport, but I'm not going to have a time for us to gain any game and loss. It's just not my, my thing. But to see that what happened to those fans when they left their club, it was absolutely heartbreaking, and I thought, I've got to help, I've got to do whatever I can. And that's why myself, along with the Darwin Football Club Rescue Group, Doug Embleton, he was the other person who sort of decided that when the, the news broke, and we had to somehow find noise to get people to listen. And it was all through money, my mind was all through the story of it. That's why they got in touch with me to try and help them. Because we knew our links with the FA, etc. Those links were very good at saving the administrative life of the club. But it was enough for the for those challenging the club to have faith in me to help them. And I was really proud I did. Let's go on to the next uh, slide here. It's the left one. That's a close one. So I give you my word. I will, David, I will absolutely get that to you too. This is Arthur. Arthur wasn't born at all in Gary. He was a son of a master back then. His family were people of means. But when he came to Darlington and, and achieved all these great feats as a footballer and as an athlete, his family and Gary had to turn him back on the church and they didn't really want to welcome him back into Ghana. It was quite a sad story. So Arthur went to work in the corporate. And it was on the coal face. He wasn't just driving all hands. He was on the coal face, digging the coal. And the little thing for him was, he looked exactly like everybody else. Because everybody was covered in black. <laughs> so I'm sure there would be humor about that happen to him. But what a wonderful man. You see, when people ask me, why did you do this, Sean? How did you, why did you get involved? It wasn't because of his football or his running and all of this. It was because he needed one thing that really took my heart. During the bleak Victorian England, in the industrial era, it was cold, it was hard, a lot of sickness, disease, poverty. This young man played seven games of football in 10 days for charity, to feed the poor, in the face of his own adversity. That took me really deeply, because we all have a little bit of that in us, we will be able to get close. You just have to reach out and help where you can. And the fact that he was that, it kind of moved me. And I thought, well, hey, that's enough to convince me it's worth it. Oh, I'm tricking, I'm telling you my mind up there, excuse me. Um, this is, right, so how do we celebrate after? I thought, well, look, what we're going to have to do is to create something. And what normally happens is when you go to a council and you want to create, by the way, uh, 
that moment we got home, it doesn't exist. That was stolen from us some years ago. It, it's not died anymore. Um, yeah. We're actually at the Walton Foundation government, but we've moved somewhere. Um, so I created this maquette. Um, how did I create it? Well, I thought we need a statue of Arthur. He deserves one. Everything is achieved in his humanitarian spirit that drove, uh, you know, my passion and enthusiasm to do the right thing meant we needed a testimony making. So what we did was I went online, I searched Google, and I just looked at sculptures. I didn't look for a sculptor. I just wanted a statue to move me. And I saw this one statue, and it was of a, an Irish dancer. And it was like this. And it was like, oh, it was like you could look beyond the phoenixes. It was like it was moving. And I thought, whoever did that is going to create our life. It just so happened to be Vivian Muller, the royal sculptor. Right. <laughs> so I thought, oh my God, I don't know. And I thought, I said, well, I made a pack for myself, I'm going to get it. I rang her. Um, and it was just wonderful. She taught me, obviously, the story about that, and said, look, Sean, I said, I haven't got like, any sort of name. We, we, we just don't. But we want you to make this up. Well, a few years later, of course, that was really easy. And Vivian came on board. She was the most wonderful person to school over you could ever imagine. But I was getting phone calls from agents and people connected with football, you know, the sporting industry. Hey, John, congratulations. I hear you've got a statue. Uh, you've been, you know, you found a sculptor. I was like, yes, I have. Vivian Muller. Oh, where's he from? Where did you find him? Uh, what's he like? And I'm thinking, it's not a he, it's a she. <laughs> So I said, well, it's not Vivian, it's Vivian. And in a nutshell, it was basically, you, you women in the audience will appreciate it. And I hope you men do too. Oh, how come you've got a last to do it then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, surely it's football. And, and I'm, I'm saying, sorry, I'm not with you, what do you mean? And they said, oh, no, I didn't mean anything. I said, you did. <laughs> you did mean something, you meant, he meant a man should sculpt a statue of a man because his football is a man thing, is that right? Lest we forget, in 1921, men came back from the First World War, right? And they watched women playing football. Women, while the men were at war, were getting 50 to 80,000 people watching them play football. That's what women were getting. Men came back from the war, they weren't getting the audiences, so they banned women. From playing football from 1921 to 19. Do any of you know when you were allowed to play football? Really? You won't believe this. 1973 or 4. Yeah. Just think about our women, how young girls now playing for our country in the World Cup right now. How far behind are they in terms of their life choices, their opportunities? All because of men. Their ego couldn't take it. Women were banned from 19th, anyway. There we go. So, anyway, and then it was a case of, right, how do I get attention for Arthur? I got in touch with George Boyton, who you can see on this picture. He's obviously not Stevie Wonder, he's the other chap. Um, he was the captain of Middlesbrough at the time. In this funky shopping mall in Darlington, there was one person who used to collect my art at home and hard work. And he happened to be the physio and it was the football player. But I didn't know that art a guy called Grant Downey, a Scotsman, who immediately identified when he walked in the shop and said, Oh, what's, what's all this? And I said, Oh, I have to walk. And I was very enthusiastic and oh, it was this, it was that. Um, and he said, Oh, I actually um, work in football, you know. I said, Oh, really? I said, well, I'm looking to find a local guy named somebody who plays football to come on board and help your champions. So he said, oh, I've been George Boateng in play. I said, really? <laughs> I said, well, thank you very much. So he watched George Boateng. So I broke it in the corner. Did it wasn't interested in me. He got on the drums and started playing the drums. But what that did was, like I said, I was an absolute model. Still like that. But sometimes, if you're going to do the right thing, you need some kind of allyship. From people who should be doing something for our part. This was the point. The Football Association, FIFA, UEFA, PFA, 
None of them could do anything. Nothing of yours, nothing of me. It's not my responsibility, it's theirs to protect their history, their antiquities, their points of reference, so they can have a better future. So that we racism in football can be taken on board in a different way. It can be challenged in a different way. So ten minutes reading. So you see I do need that. Well now it's really wonderful. Oh well, thank you. And then yeah, that makes a great ask back and uh raise any questions. Um so yeah, I got the ticket for a trade fair in Birmingham for to buy a furniture from the shop. And on the back of it, Stephen Woodry comes in. So I thought, oh, I'll stay next to day, watch the evening concert, and we'll come back on Tuesday. But you know what? I went to bed that night and I thought, if there's one person in the world who would understand the importance of what I want to do, it would be him. Don't ask me now, but within 14 hours, I was, uh, I got the yes, I'll do it. And live on stage, Stevie Wonder hit the piano, bam, 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 down into me, kept it in. Half a world, and I thought, oh, my what? In front of 14, 15,000 people, first concert we've done in 10 years since we've all died and all the back and stuff. So it was a bigger thing to do it. I it was a lot of emotion up there. Georgie was upset, I was upset, you know, but it was beautiful. It was only three weeks later when I rolled over and said to my wife, Was I really going to do this? Can you do it? You see, when I'm doing these things, I, I, we have an unofficial sign. We don't do the way, we do the right thing. Does anything to do with these girls after what we do, we're just not interested. So when we're doing things, it's got to be about that. So when I'm doing that, I simply am an ambassador, not just for my family, or for Darlington, or for the North East. It's for the whole thing that Apple represents. You can't let anything get in the way of that. So it has to be just about that. So I don't enjoy these things. Everybody was living with Apple Great Smith because they're leaving very, you know, interesting people. I'm there because there's a reason to be there. Um, what should you need to say that? Viv Anderson, first ever black football left England. That was 1978. Right? That's four years before Paul Canada became the first black footballer for Chelsea. Can you believe that? 1982. When Chelsea was first ever black player. It's not that long ago, is it? It took a long time for these teams to get there. But we think we got a lot. The Blacklist Awards is a ceremony where people are celebrated for ch championing, you know, the right to have that voice heard. And everybody was in the industry, and this is DJ Spoonie with a statue. It's very, very important that people like the Blacklist Awards exist because it pays tribute to people in the black and brown community who are achieving, who are thus far not the best chosen, and it's a very important cause. The reason Manchester United was kind of close with as well, the last game that Arthur Rock never played was against Newton Heath. That was Manchester United, right? Or rather, Newton Heath became Manchester United. Right? That very season, exactly the same as Arthur playing the Newcastle and District, and that same season, they became Newcastle United. We have heard of the Cup, and of course, the Newcastle legends, I don't know the United legend, Andrew Crawl, Andrew Crawl, Andrew Crawl, wonderful person. This is how I managed to get support around me, just bringing out to us attention. I'm trying to instill in you a sense of, there is always a way and if you don't think you're the right person to do it, somebody else always can, but you need to make that contact. It's, you, you don't have to have all the power in your words to say, I can open up my book and I can contact you ever. The lesson is really quite simple. If it's not you, find support from elsewhere. Set latter, FIFA. It was really important in, you remember earlier I was saying to you about the duty and responsibility of those authorities to pay respect to their work. You shouldn't have people like me doing this. FIFA should have done it a long time ago. So it should be where it's going to be fair. Similar to Vivian Mallet, the sculptor, when I saw people got word I was going to meet at Latin in Zurich uh, to present him with the statue, 
because he, he's going to make a donation to the foundation. Not him, but FIFA. Hey, Sean, you need to set that to that. My God, the guy's crooks, but I want the ropes. He's bad news, man. Don't get involved in him. This is why he was in the agency, people like that. And I'm like, oh, it, it's your problem, isn't it? I'm not involved in football. I'm involved in doing the right thing. By one of their own, by society. The world needs to know about this young man. He can inspire generations of people. If only they know about that. So going to Seth Blatter, I have to say, was quite an experience. And Seth Blatter donated, not him, but FIFA donated. You know, I wish I was wise back like in the day. He said, I'm, you know, who's doing I said, well, if everybody chips in, it's going to 30,000, we'll give you 30,000. If I asked for 300,000, you'd be giving me. <laughs> but I was not aiming for that. I was innocent, gullible, you know. But 30,000 was enough for me to be able to say, right, we can now start looking to get a statue of Arthur. And by the way, he gave his only live broadcast to BBC teams on that day. His communications team were having absolute kittens because I said, Seth, if you mean it, you'll get on with BBC. You were there. <laughs> He's the guy who filmed it. Oh, you brought it, actually. And wasn't he magnificent? You know, he spoke from the heart. He was emotional. And he got it. And thank you for that, Seth Lotter, despite the comments. We also presented him totally unexpected with one of these plaques at our very own northeast artists and it, it, it moved to set blacks on the invasion of the people because they weren't expecting that. Gordon Taylor, right, anybody involved in the unions needs to understand Gordon Taylor has been very good to us, he was, you know, he's been very helpful, but he's the highest paid union rep in the world. When he parted ways, he was in two million a year as a union rep. That doesn't sit right with me, but anyway, he's, he's a nice bro. Um, but again, Gordon Taylor, but you see, the importance is bringing the recognition of Arthur to the attention of those people who should be championing That's why we're showing you these pictures, rather than the modern pictures of our current stairs. This was England playing Ghana for the first time ever in the history at senior level. And there you'll see on the screen, Cyril Regis, God rest his soul, very, very close to us. When he passed away, I mean, it was heartbreaking. Brendan Batson, Trevor Buckley, etc. And the lady in the pink coat, that is Arthur's great great granddaughter, Sheila Neeson, who lives in Lobbyham. Now, if you understand that Arthur Walton was mixed race, you find this book, of course, because the first level of discrimination and oppression in your face is the colour of the skin. It won't be exactly mixed. It'll be all the other so and so, you know. Um, but the FA, well, like, oh, no, we can't retribute Arthur at this game. I said, well, I would be negligent if I allowed you to be negligent in not doing the right thing that would be our own. So I have a loose and sit. And of course, we ended up on the pitch with the statue, with this very statue of Arthur. And it was beautiful. And it was Ghana, the country of Arthur's birth, playing the country <coughs> that Arthur lived his life. How could they not see? It, not just the opportunity to raise awareness and educate people who is so. But it took me to actually do that for us. One minute before questions, so if you have any questions, this was a presentation at the uh, um, uh, the Houses of Parliament to the chairman of uh, the FA who came on board. The England place with the statue. I wanted to show you this video. I will start this video. It shows you the unveiling of the statue. It's really just so you can see it, and I will stop it. Okay? If, do I click on the red? Today is a historic day to mark the achievements and the legacy of the late great Arthur Rawdon. It's inspirational, it's incredible. It's symbolic if you can see that it's in the centre of the St. George's Cross. It's absolutely amazing. I never thought it would be in Malacca. And this is the beginning of you know, a true recognition for the contributions of the Black and African minority groups to this country. It's been a long journey, but it's been one of the absolute honour and privilege of the part of the world. We don't have time to follow all the numbers. That is the biggest statue of the sport of the country. You're on that walk, but you never met that walk in any way. The more you read about the about 
diversity among that place or gender and sexuality, the more people are talking openly, then the better that can be you and Dharma on top to it. So she made them and those very, very, very 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 of course, some of them, these are two Ghanaians, that's the one Jenny John Minster. They came to play for some of them. Of course, I want them on board, and they were fantastic. They got on board with it, brought into a lot of attention. So now, after the new Ghana, this was the after what we uh, celebration again with Ali Ghana. These guys were unbelievable. And to take our from the northeast to Jamestown and Pride Ghana was just a beautiful thing. I'm going back over there in uh, the 19th of October. That's the vice president of the Ghana Football Association. That is the slave castle at Cape Coast, and uh, that was a deeply emotional moment for me. Signing out that the first slave in Barbados could be given down. That's my point. And when we go to that castle, and when you understand the nature of that castle, um, I just wept. That's uh, most of you. Because you, of course, are getting an inheritance. It's taken me the last year and a half years to persuade Chris to get involved with Ghana. He's now the manager of the Ghana National Football Team. But it's obviously an icon in the world here in the Northeast, having been the manager for that for um, Newcastle. I'm just trying to find one picture. Features of the ground. I don't know if any of you are watching TV at the minute, but that's Hugh Quashie, uh, an actor. And I had this big campaign to try and save Featons, which is the actual ground that I have to make his name. But that has houses built in it. This is Michelle Fatini in Rome, and uh, similarly, Michelle Fatini, Brown Wood Rocks, Corruption, he did us proud on that day because it was all about Arthur. It wasn't about him, it wasn't about football, it was about the legacy of Arthur. And then Michelle Fatini in the UF was the very first organization to come on. I'm going to Carl Sade off the most celebrated money football ever, and uh, to have him come and go the champion of this was extraordinary. This is the picture of the National Football Museum. If any of you go to Manchester and you walk in, isn't it wonderful that the first thing we're going to see is the Northeast of Hero? I'm just going to skip through this now. Uh, this is the Arthur's family in Ghana. We took Sheila over, you can see Sheila here at the, at the bottom. And this is a black family in Ghana. Now, think about that. And there's a wonderful moment where Elizabeth Grant, Arthur's black relative, turns to the camera and says, doesn't it make a refreshing change for white people to be searching their black foods? <laughs> Only a powerful woman to say that and we get to get away with it. And that's what it was, and it was brilliant. And it's the truth. There's Sheila, her best of soul. She passed away recently. There's the headstone with the long bed on it, 13. <coughs> There's the statue of St. George's Park, as you can see, it's massive. If any of you are in Burton or Shanks or passing by, please do call in, stand by that statue, and send me a picture of the logo. These are all people from the Professional Footballers Association, etc. Like the great mess of the cross, we had to open the bottle of champagne in the day. It was fabulous. And that cup there is the Princess Anne Pashik Cup. That's the trophy that happened in 1886 in front of the World's Classic Man. I found that cup as well. And that is really very, very celebrated. And above half his name, you have Harold Abraham's favorite with him, Chariot Sapphire. And then you have Reggie Walker, Lindsay Christie, Alan Wells. It's like, no, don't worry. The only one that could trophy of Grandpa. But that was found in the basin. Back up. There is nowhere to celebrate our uh, classic heroes. We don't have enough National Athletics Museum, it's our rivers. We're going to try and put that way too. This was at the same the anniversary games. And there was 86,000 people there. And this new statue that we're creating, this is a match for Darlington. That will actually dwarf the already, like, this will be 25 months old. And it will be outside fencing as well after the year. I'm going to show you on that. And we're really racing. And we put him on lane seven at the end of the 100 meters track. We just said, Oh, we're going to be there. But we had to do it. We managed to get him in there. And there's the actual cup of course. It's just remarkable. Right, I'm going to stop that there because 
it's impossible to talk about that for far more. I hope you have had enough information, and my whole objective here was to give you enough information that if you were sufficiently motivated and inspired, you can go and look for more information. Just look on the Arthur Walton Foundation website, you'll find lots of information. When this documentary comes out, you will know about it, believe me. 